Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. Students, it's not too late to register for MFuge. All middle and high school students need to go to fortheneighborhood.com slash students and register by March the 1st. Church family, we are now accepting nominations for new deacons. If you have a name that you would like to submit for consideration, please complete the form at deacons.westb.org. Your input is appreciated as we move forward to add new deacons to our church body. Windshake Camp for Communities is back this summer. Join us July the 5th through 9th at Bradenton Christian School for the ultimate day camp, combining fun, faith, and friendship into an action-packed week. Registration opens March the 1st. The cost is $169 per camper, but register the week of March the 1st through 7th and get an automatic $20 scholarship. Camp is for kids completing kindergarten through eighth grade. Get more info at camps.windshape.org. Everyone is invited to our church family picnic Sunday at 4 p.m. We will be gathering near the playground in the grass parking lot. Sandwiches will be provided, and guests are asked to bring either a side dish or dessert to share. We hope to see you there. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing.
there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you nobody gets famous because of humility Humility is not valued in our culture. I doubt most job interviews press into humility. Some may, but most don't. Publishers don't pursue biographies of people who are humble. Entertainers are, are not known for their humility, even if they are humble people. It, it's almost as if humility is boring. For whatever reason, the thing that grabs our eye is is valued more and humility has the opposite purpose less attention it doesn't get the eyeballs there's an old phrase and i love this old phrase um it it says this humility is not thinking less of yourself humility is thinking of yourself less i think that's a good way for us to consider this topic as we're covering our series in Philippians and going verse by verse through Philippians. Uh, Before we jump into the text, I do want to give you one verse that I think applies to this concept of being humble. It's James 4, 6. Here's what James writes. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride says, I am mine, but humility says, no, I am his. I belong to Christ. And when Christ is your identity, your entire perspective changes. The proud person is the one who says, you know, I know exactly how life should go and I deserve to get that life. But it is the humble person that says, I don't deserve life at all. And I'm thankful for any grace in this life that God gives me. The proud person will be disappointed, but the humble person finds joy. That's what we're talking about today, a humble joy. The proud person has a lot to lose. The humble person has nothing to lose. So how do we find joy in humility? Paul gives us an answer in Philippians chapter 2, and Christ is our example. So get your Bibles out, turn them on, open them up. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at several verses in chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should not only look out for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Joy is complete, as it says in verse 2, when we humbly put others first, as it says in verse 3. And Paul is going to make a shift in chapter 2 from chapter 1. He's moving away from the theme of the gospel advancing to the theme of Christian humility, and these two things go together. The fact that we would be talking about being humble while also advancing the gospel makes sense because arrogance is not a good vehicle for the gospel. It is humility that exalts Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, he writes in verse 3. Our goal in life is not to be self-serving. And if you look at verse 5, we see this transitional verse that Uh, moves away from talking about believers and how we are to act to the example, which is the perfect example of Jesus. And we get this beautiful hymn in verses 6 through 11 
and Christ is the example, and we are to adopt the attitude of Jesus. So here's some questions to consider concerning your own humility. How do you know if you're humble or not? Well, let's walk through some questions, and I think these questions will be very revealing. Do you believe God owes you something? If you believe God owes you something, that means you may not be as humble as you think. Have you ever been critical of others' successes? So somebody has something that they accomplished in their life and you were critical of that. Is, is that humble? No. Have you ever had trouble admitting you were wrong? Talk to your spouse if you're married. I'm sure they can answer that question for you. Are you regularly at the center of conflict? These are questions that are important as we talk about our own humility and as we talk about how we might be prideful. Now, in this section where Paul writes about Jesus and, and we get this hymn about the uh, humility or the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ, um, we see the example that Christ is. So the first half, the verses 6 through 8, is, is the humiliation of Christ, and we see what Jesus is willing to do to save us. But then at the end of this hymn, verses 9 through 11, we get the exaltation of Christ. Now, in this passage, we see that as Christ humbled himself, it says that he emptied himself. Now, what did he empty himself of? And, and we see the explanation. He, Because this is a very important theological question. Jesus is God. What did he empty himself of? But we're told in this hymn what he emptied himself of. He, empt he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. Here's the beauty of what Jesus did. This is subtraction by addition. He added the limitations of humanity to his divinity. So this is what makes Jesus the God-man, fully human, fully God. Subtraction by addition. He humbled himself by becoming like us. So God, as Christ was here on earth, God got tired. God, Jesus, got hungry and thirsty, and he had to grow and learn. He was tempted and experienced horrific physical, spiritual, and emotional pain. He emptied himself by taking on the form of humanity. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, it says in verse 8. Why? because he wants to bring you good news. He is our good news. It is Jesus Christ who saves. Only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can offer God's grace. It is through his sacrifice on the cross, the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And when, and when you, th that's how we're saved. And so Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, a death we should have gotten, and Jesus took that death instead of us. And then God raised him to life three days later, and in the resurrection, we learn that we can have eternal life with God. And the way we receive this life, the way we receive eternity with God, is to repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and accept the grace that only God can give through Jesus Christ. And so it was Jesus who took steps downward to save us. And we look upward to know that it's not about us. Think of it this way. Since we have the blessing of salvation, we must live the responsibilities of salvation. Notice the, uh, the if-then statements at the beginning of chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement, if any consolation of, of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection, then do these things. So it's a conditional statement. That's an if-then statement. Since you have these blessings, then you also have these responsibilities. So we get the blessings in verse 1. Encouragement, love, fellowship, affection, mercy, a complete joy that God gives. And because we have these blessings, verse 2 then tells us what the responsibilities are. Be unified. Be considerate. Be concerned. This is how we live out the salvation that God gives us. We can't earn our way to God. He gives us his grace, but once we receive this grace, we then live our salvation. We get salvation in Christ, and then 
as that's the blessing, and then we have the responsibility to live it out. So we get some words here that we, that we need to be unified, that we need to have the same love, we need to think in the same way, we need to be united in spirit, we need to have one purpose. This is the way that believers are supposed to live. We're also supposed to be considerate, and in humility, consider others as more important than ourselves. We also need to be concerned. We need to look out for the interests of others. So this, these are ways that we live out our salvation. These are ways that we remain humble and the way that we know that we have a humble joy. Now, there's three key phrases of humble concern for others, and the first is this. Um, we need to relate to someone's situation. So let, let's think about the principles that we find in Philippians chapter 2. Let's relate to someone's situation, which means that we need to be able to listen, that we need to hear them out, that we need to try to understand where they're coming from, which gets us to the second point. We need to con connect with their concerns. So not only listen carefully and listen well, let's connect with what they're really concerned about so that we can learn where they're coming from. And then lastly, let's engage in a solution. We need to act on it. So we've heard somebody out, we know where they're coming from, now let's engage and act on this knowledge. This is what Jesus did. Jesus set aside his privileges as God to save us, and we must set aside our privileges in order to serve others. So let me ask you, what do you feel entitled to? This is every one of us. So I have some things that I feel entitled to, very likely you do too. What do you feel entitled to? All of us feel entitled to something. It's human nature. This is what we must push against when we're talking about the humble joy that God gives. When we worship together, one of the main purposes is to root out entitlement and to keep us focused on the exalted one, which has the name, according to verse 9 here, has the name above every other name in your own life. Is Jesus' name above your name? Is your knee bowed? Is your tongue confessing who Christ is? You see, when you empty yourself, it means that you can pour better into others. When you live out this humility, it means that you can serve others better. And here's even better news. The Holy Spirit keeps filling you up. The more you empty yourself, the more you can pour into others, and the more full of the Holy Spirit you become. Let me, let, me, let me look at this from the perspective of a story. So almost every story contains three main characters, the protagonist, the good guy, the antagonist, the bad guy, and the victim. And the victim is the one that is harmed and ultimately rescued. And this is the way most stories go, protagonist, antagonist, and victim. Now here's the thing about the victim. We always feel badly for the victim. We're supposed to. We're supposed to like the protagonist, cheer for the protagonist. We're supposed to uh, dislike and cheer against the antagonist, and then we feel badly for the victim. Playing the victim in your life feels the best because victims are let off the hook because they are on the receiving end of injustice. And for the most part, they are helpless. Here's the problem with playing the victim, though. Victims do not grow, and victims do not transform the story. Victims do not rescue others. Victims do not get stronger. Victims do not overcome. And hear me out. There are people who have experienced some terrible things by no fault of their own, and maybe that's you. Maybe you have been victimized. Maybe you have been the victim. But even in those cases, as hard as, as hard as it is, is what you may have experienced, you cannot live as a victim because you'll never grow. Here's the reality. We're the antagonist because <laughs> we sin against God. Our sin is an offense against God. And Jesus is the hero, the one who overcomes our sin and the one who's sacrificed for our sin. Humble joy. Humble joy then grows stronger through consistent character. What does this look like? So if we're not going to live as victims, if we're going to have humble joy, 
and we're going to be consistent in our character. Paul kind of talks about this later in this passage. So let's pick up in verse 12. Let me read you through verse 18. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ and that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the, sacrifi on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Just as you have always obeyed, verse 12. Verse 16, holding firm. You've always obeyed, verse 16, holding firm. This is the consistency of humble joy. We will not see this world changed for Christ unless we approach our work with consistent humility and a servant's heart. And the way, the way to joy runs through sacrifice. I mean, so much of the way that we're supposed to live as believers runs right through sacrifice. The, the, the passage here talks about being poured out as an offering, that we have a sacrificial service, and that pouring out of ourselves and that sacrificial service is ultimately what leads to the rejoicing in worship in verse 18. You're not saved by good works. Only Jesus saves. But what Paul is saying here is you'd better live out your salvation. Why? This world can't see salvation. You, you, can't, you can't show a picture of salvation. I mean, you could show a picture of Jesus and that would be salvation. But, but you can't really see salvation, but people do see your works. They are the visible fruit of our salvation. Humanity cannot do the work of God, but God accomplishes his work through his people. God needs an army of consistent Christians picking up their crosses daily. This is where it's consistent. We're consistent. And by the way, we need to do this out grumbling or arguing, as it says in verse 14. Choosing to complain, which a lot of us do, which I do, all of us. <laughs> by the way, when you're complaining, you're not showing humble joy. Choosing to complain, frankly, is choosing to stay in the wilderness. Complaining is the junk food of emotions. Let's think about what happened in Exodus chapter 13 and 14 when Pharaoh releases the Israelites from slavery after God sends a series of plagues and they escape, but then they encounter that first physical barrier, which is the Red Sea. And Pharaoh regrets his decision about letting them go, and then he sends the Egyptian army after them to go get them and to bring them back and to re-enslave them. And, and so they are. They're up against the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is closing in on them on one side, and they've got a giant body of water on the other side, and they have nowhere to go, and fear absolutely paralyzes the Hebrew people. And what did they do? In Exodus 14, 12, they, they tell Moses, we told you, Moses, we were better off as slaves. What a terrible thing to say. The people present what is called a, a false dichotomy or a false dilemma. Either we're going to die or we got to go back as slaves. And neither of those two things is true. There's another option. And see, this is basically the same lie from Satan today. You're going to die. So you might as well live for yourself. Be a slave to yourself. But God gives us another way. Just like just like with the Hebrew people, the Israelites, up against the Red Sea with the Egyptian army closing in on them, there is a third option. What if God can give a miracle of deliverance? Let's think about the Hebrew people. They've just witnessed 10 major plagues. God did those things. God performed those things. And God crushed the power structure of the most powerful nation on earth. So here they are at the Red Sea with the army closing in. Why are they not expecting another miracle? Why are they not pleading with God, do another one, God, do another one, we're almost there? Well, they've forgotten. They've forgotten what they were delivered from and where they are delivered to. They were delivered from Egypt. They were delivered out of slavery, and they're on their way to Canaan. They're being delivered to the Promised Land. But the only way from slavery into the Promised Land 
is through the wilderness. When God delivers you from something and to something, sometimes it means walking the wilderness in between. And in many ways, attitude is the pathway. And we're talking about humble joy in Philippians. Do you have that attitude of humble joy? You see, if you have the wrong attitude, you can get off course. You can get off course with God's will and not go where he wants you to do. And complaining, which in many ways is the opposite of humble joy, complaining, while it's a release of negative emotional energy, it solves nothing. So the people were right there, (laughs) so close to the promised land. And what did they do? They chose to grumble. And what did God do? God sent them back into the wilderness to teach them a lesson. Complaining. Complaining's not expressing dissatisfaction about something that's wrong. Sometimes you need to do that. But complaining is expressing dissatisfaction um, without a willingness to help. So you're not wrong to point out something that needs to be fixed. But if you're going to point out something, then you need to be part of the solution. Complaining is not standing up for the truth. But complaining... Complaining is using truth to be a negative person. You can be a cynic and still be truthful, and that's not the goal. Complaining is not expressing a concern. There are times to express a concern. Complaining is expressing a concern in a way that hurts others. So as Paul revealed this humble joy in chapter 2, as Christ showed us in, in his, in, in, as, we're, as we see in this hymn of Jesus and how ultimately he was humiliated and humiliated on our behalf, but then exalted by God. Jesus shows us the way. Jesus is the example. So choose Jesus over your complaints. And what will Jesus do? He will take you through the wilderness and to the promised land.